the basic procedure we need to do with our, our fixed, fixed routing or adaptive routing is somehow learn about the topology of the network. So that, that means who is connected to who and what are the link costs. So we need to learn that information because you imagine a node here in Bangkok in a network a, across the country doesn't immediately know about the other links across the country. So we need to somehow learn about the topology of the network. Once we know that, we can calculate the least cost routes from one node to other nodes. And let's say from one node to all other possible destinations because potentially we may need to send data to anywhere in the network. So calculate the least cost routes. And again, we have algorithms to do that. So an algorithm that takes this topology information can calculate the least cost routes. Then use those least cost routes to create our routing tables. The routing tables store the destination and the next node in the least cost route. So for example, our least cost route from 1 to 6 is 1, 4, 5, 6. The routing table for node 1 would store in one row destination 6, next node 4. So that when node 1 has a packet to send to node 6, it sends it to node 4 by looking up the routing table. It looks in the routing table for the destination it wants to reach and finds the next node. And what we saw uh, on Monday with, with an example was that if we have a least cost route, 1, 4, 5, 6, then it means that the segments within that route are also least cost routes. If 1, 4, 5, 6 is a least cost route, then 4, 5, 6 is also a least cost route from 4 to 6. And we use that so that allows us just to store the next node in the routing table, simplifying the routing table. Fixed, fixed routing, we, let's say at the start of the network, given the network topology information, determine the routes, create the routing tables, and then use those routing tables to send data. They don't change, or at least until there's a major change in the network. Adaptive routing, we're running a network for a long time. The conditions change over time, either on a daily basis or even more frequently. Every second, the conditions change, because the conditions include how much data is being sent across the links. Because the amount of data being sent impacts upon the delay and the performance. So if our routes want to take that into account, we need to get some regular or some frequent updates about the conditions of the network. So adaptive routing tries to learn the current conditions of the network, that is the topology and the link costs, and recalculates the routes as needed so that we always or aim to always get the least cost routes in our routing table. But still we use routing tables and <coughs> we send in the same way as fixed routing. Let's look at a completely different approach for getting data from A to B. So the purpose, remember, is to get data from source to destination. When we have multiple possible paths, then routing tries to find the best path from source to destination. And then we send that data across that one path. Flooding is, has the same goal of getting data from source to destination, but it takes a completely different approach in that we just send the data across all paths. We don't choose the best path. If we send data across all paths in the network, then the destination should receive a copy and then we've achieved our aim. So flooding, same purpose, get data from A to B, but completely different approach than what we've seen with calculating least cost routes and routing tables. So instead of choosing a path, choosing a route, we just send the data to everyone. It's like we need to drive here into Bangkok. Normally we choose a path to take, a set of roads to take. Maybe we look up on Google Maps and it tells us which roads to, t to take, which, where to turn and so on. Well, flooding, imagine we need to get some um, 
uh, a package, uh, a parcel into somewhere in Bangkok, then flooding, the idea is that we make many copies of this package, this parcel, and we put a copy in many different cars. And we tell people to drive their car and just go somewhere across the roads and eventually some of them will, event will get to the destination. So we make copies of the data and send multiple copies of the data with the hope, and eventually if we use the, the right procedure, that one copy will get to the destination. So there are different rules that we apply, but uh, we'll demonstrate them and we started with this example. Send a copy of the packet to all your neighbors. And then as you receive a packet, follow the same rule. Send a copy of that packet you received to all of your neighbors. And everyone keeps doing that and eventually it's received at the destination. with some exceptions or some, some conditions on those rules. And they are listed here, one to, through to five. Uh, the first one, when you receive a packet, we say send a copy to all of your neighbours, but you don't have to send it back to the node that just sent it to you. The idea is to get a copy of this packet to everyone. So, when you receive a copy, send it to all your neighbours, but you know it just came from the one who sent it to you, so there's no need to send a copy back to them. So that's the first exception or extension here. Uh, the other ones... All right, we'll, come, we'll demonstrate the other four uh, a little bit later. In fact, this example has extension, the first extension, and also extension number four, a hop limit, which is what this number means in the packet. But what we said, if we assume we ignore this number, one sends to all of its neighbors, two, three, and four. Two, three, and four just received a copy of the packet, sent to all of their neighbors except who sent it to them. As we see, four is about to receive two copies of the packet from node two and node three. So if we think of the next step, four is about to receive from two and three. So it's going to receive a packet from two and the rule says receive a packet, send to all your neighbors. But then it's going to receive another packet from node three. So again, the rule says receive a copy of the packet, send to all your neighbors. So that's why in the next step, four received from two and three, so from the one it received from two, it sends to one, three, and five, and from the copy of the packet it received from three, it sends to two, one, and five. That's why we see two packets going to one and two to five. And actually in the previous step, one packet gets delivered to six, here, and in fact in the next step some more packets get delivered to six. So that was our goal, get the data to, from one to six. We, we've achieved our goal. How many packets sent? A lot, count them. Well, yeah, all the ones. How many here? Three. So recall that the goal is to get one copy of the packet from node 1 to node 6. Let's see how many transmissions are needed inside the network to do that. In this case, in the first step, there are three. So three so far. In the next step, you can count them. We've got two plus four plus three, so another nine, so up to twelve. Twelve so far. In the next step, okay, we need to count them, another four, sixteen, plus six, twenty-two, plus four here is twenty-six, plus another eight is thirty-four. If you count all of those packets, there are thirty-four packets there. And let's stop there. In fact, uh, we'll come back and explain why I've stopped after this step. We, we could keep going and keep transmitting. But thirty-four packets sent through the network to get one piece of data from node 1 to node 6, using flooding in this case. 
what if we were using fixed routing and we had already determined the least cost routes so we we determined the least cost routes created the routing tables how many packets would need to be transmitted in uh, okay yes two in this case if we ignore the cost of the links that we had in the previous example if we just take uh, using the hops as the the metric for least least cost then in this case to get data from one to six the best case is to send from one to three that's one transmission and then three to six two two hops two transmissions <coughs> using least cost routing two packet transmissions to get data from one to six using flooding 34 packet transmissions to get the same piece of data from 1 to 6. Flooding is much more inefficient than using fixed or adaptive routing because we need to send many copies of that one piece of data through the network. So we're using many of the network resources to deliver, let's say, the same 1,000 bytes from 1 to 6. So that's the problem with flooding. It's very inefficient compared to finding the least cost routes. The advantage is it's very simple. There's no concept of calculating the routes. We don't need to know about the network topology. Node 1 doesn't need to know about the links over here. All it needs to know is who are its neighbors. Given that, just send to your neighbors, and then those nodes know their neighbors, so they send to their neighbors. And eventually, it gets to node 6. So very, very simple, but very, very inefficient. The extensions here try to make it a little bit more efficient. Try to reduce the number of packets we send. In my example, I said, okay, node 1 transmits to its neighbors. 2, 3, and 4 send to their neighbors, and then the next step they send to neighbors. Note, after this step, focus on node 4, it's going to receive a packet from 5, from 2, and from 3. It's going to receive 3 packets. So with our normal rules, it will receive a packet and send to its neighbors again. So there'll be another step, I just haven't drawn it here. 4 would send 3 copies to its neighbors, as would other nodes. So we'd keep sending. And we could keep going forever, keep transmitting. We want to limit that because in this case, the data has already been delivered to 6, so there's no need for the network to keep sending those packets. We've achieved our aim. The normal way that we limit that is using a hop limit. Extension 4 here. Hop limit, a hop counter. In every packet we send <coughs> inside the header, we, we include an extra value which, is, which counts the number of hops we've traversed. Or usually in the reverse, it counts uh, the number of hops remaining that we're allowed to traverse. So we usually set it, and we'll go to our example. In this case, we start with a hop limit of 3 in this example. I've chosen 3. What that means is when node 1 sends the first copy of the packets, inside the header of those packets, it includes that hop limit of 3. Sends to its neighbors. When a node receives the packet, it looks at the hop limit. If the hop limit is 0, it will not send any more. If it is not zero, it will reduce it and then send. So in this case, actually I think I've got that wrong. Uh, receive, look at the hop limit, decrease, if it's zero, don't send, if it's non-zero, then send. So, two receives a packet, the hop limit was three, it reduces it to two and sends as do 3 and 4. Next step, 
nodes receive copies of the packet, they reduce the hop limit down to one, it's not zero yet, so send. Next step, for example, node four is going to receive a packet with hop limit one from node five. It will reduce it down to zero. Okay, it will not send now. So when you receive a packet, look at the hop limit inside the header, decrement it by one. If it's zero, do not send any more copies. The idea is to stop the, the transmissions in the network. And you see with a hop limit initially of three, no packets will traverse more than three hops. We see, look at this packet, it goes one hop to node four, and let's say it's this one, or it's these three, but this one, it goes a second hop to node five, and then node five transmits a third hop to node six. It will not go four hops, because our hop limit is three. Okay, so the hop limit is introduced to, to limit how many hops our packets will traverse. It means we won't keep sending forever. That's why I stopped in this, case, in this example here, and we have 34 transmissions. Another extension. When you receive a packet, for the first time, you send to all your neighbors, except who sent it to you. But if you receive that same packet again, don't send it again, because you know your neighbors have already received it. So to do that, nodes remember the packets that they have already sent. And to do that, we need some sequence number. So now, the header needs to contain a sequence number. And it's not in this example, but we'll see, okay, 2, 3, and 4 receive a copy. Let's say the sequence number inside this packet, it's not shown, is 1. So the header contains a hop limit of 3 plus a sequence number of 1. All of them are sequence number 1. All copies of that packet will have the same sequence number, sequence number 1. Node 4 receives a copy from 1. It decrements the hop limit. Sequence number is still one for the packets it sends. And node four is going to receive copies from two and three. And the sequence numbers in those packets it receives will also be one. But node four has now recorded, I just sent packet with sequence number one to my neighbors, including two, three, and five. And I've received already from node one. So in the next step, when node 4 receives a packet from 3 and 2, it will check the sequence number. And it will realize, I just received a packet with sequence number 1. I've already sent packet with sequence number 1 to my neighbors, so I will not send again. So what would happen in the next step, focusing on node 4, it sends 3, it would receive 2, it would not have these six transmissions here because it's already sent, it's already received from node 1, it's already sent packet with sequence number 1 with, to node 2, 3, and 5, it's not going to send again to those nodes. There's no point in sending the same copy of the packet to the same nodes again. And that's a way to significantly reduce the number of transmissions. You could count them. How many? If we use a sequence number, how many packets transmitted? We saw without a sequence number there are 34 transmitted. With a sequence number, all right, we still need to transmit these first three. We still have three packets. And similar, the first time a node receives a packet, it's going to send to its neighbors. So 2, 3, and 4 are going to send these packets. So we have 3 plus another 9. We have 12 packets transmitted so far. Then the next step, who is going to send a packet? Well, three is, 4 is going to receive the same sequence number packet. 
it's not going to send again. Four is finished. Once we've already transmitted the packets to our neighbours, we won't send that same packet again. So four will not send anything, two will not send anything, three will not send anything, one will not, it's already transmitted. Five is going to receive two copies of the packet with sequence number one. It will transmit copy, a copy of that packet to its neighbours that it hasn't received from. It's received from three, it will not send back to three. It's received from four, it will not send back to four. It will send to node six. So we have 12 so far. In the next step, five will send one to six, meaning 13 transmissions. Six is not going to send to its neighbours because six is the destination. So we're done. So by introducing a sequence number, we can cut the transmissions down from 34 to just 13. A significant reduction in the overhead of, of sending packets. With, with least cost routing, the number of packets needed to be transmitted, the least cost path considering hops is 136, so there are two transmissions. With flooding, with a hop limit of 3 and no sequence numbers, we counted 34 transmissions. If we have flooding with a hop limit of 3 but with sequence numbers, we get just 13 transmissions. We want to minimize the number of packets sent in the network to deliver data from 1 to 6. The best case is 2. It's the best we can do. With no sequence numbers, we have 34 transmissions. That's very bad. With sequence numbers, we cut it down to 13, which is better than 34, but nowhere near as, as good as just 2. So in fact, actually in that step we combine 2 and 3. We also, using sequence numbers, if I've received packet with sequence number 1, or if I receive two copies with packet sequence, two copies with sequence number 1, I only need to send to my neighbours once. No need to, de to care about the duplicate packets. The, the same packets, or the packets with the same sequence number. I can discard the duplicates. So that those are the f main four mechanisms used in flooding, what we call full flooding. We flood to the full network. And we commonly use all of them, those four. It, it's What's the disadvantage of including a sequence number? Well, it's a little bit more complexity at the nodes and we have a little bit more overhead in the packets. But we have a significant reduction in the overhead of the number of packets sent, so it's usually included. Hop limit, commonly included, so that we don't send packets forever. What if we have, and I think there's a slide, all right, how many packets transmitted in the previous example was 34? How much data was delivered to the destination? Well, multiple copies of that one piece of data. What if the hop limit is 2? What happens? What if the hop limit is 2? What's the advantage and disadvantage? Look at the picture of the network. Try and move to the page in your handouts which contain the picture. Try and wake up. Uh, if you don't want to wake up, then don't come to the lecture. Sleep in. And try and find out what happens if there's a hop limit of two. What's less stress mean? Let's just see, you're transmitting less packets throughout the network, okay. causing less congestion. Less, less packets, less overhead. The, the, uh, the disadvantage is if you didn't have that one, three, one, three, you no longer have a route to Okay. 
let's see, with a hop limit of 2, what would happen? With a hop limit, instead of 3 set in the, the headers, the value would start with 2. So the, the source node sets the hop limit. In this case, we're going to set it to 2. And remember what happens, we send it, when a node receives, they decrement and check if it's 0. They will send again if it's not 0. If it's 0, they will not send. So it limits the number of hops the packet traverses. So if it starts at 2, the packet will go to 2, 3 and 4. They will all decrement, it will be down to 1. They will send to their neighbours, so you can imagine this picture, instead of 2 in the packets, there will be 1 in each of the packets. Everyone will receive, or the same ones will receive, including 5. 6 will receive a copy of the packet, that's good. 6 is the destination. 5 will receive a copy of the packet, decrement the hop count, the hop limit down to 0, and will not send to its neighbours. So there'll be one, or well, several less transmissions from node 5 in this case. We won't have all 34, we'll have a few less from node 5. If we had used a sequence number, I think we'd have one less. We'd still get data to node 6. What if we use a hop limit of 1? Sorry. Replace 3 with 1. Node 1 sends to 2, 3 and 4. 2, 3 and 4 decrement. It's 0. Once it's 0, we do not send. So 2, 3 and 4 would not send to their neighbours. So in fact, these would be the only three transmissions. 2, 3 and 4 would not send. And of course, the result there is 6 doesn't receive. So that's a problem. We've got data to get from 1 to 6 with a hop limit of 1. 6 is not going to receive it. So ineffective communications. So we need a hop limit large enough such that it will reach the destination. So in this example, a hop limit of 2 is large enough such that 6 will receive it because the least, least cost path with respect to hops is 2. In another network, we would need a different hop limit to reach the destination. And the problem is that we don't know in advance how many hops to reach the destination. So usually we need to set the hop limit high enough that will cover most cases or all cases of the, the hop distance in a network. <coughs> but we want to set it low enough such that we don't have too many extra, retra extra transmissions. So the, the choice of the hop limit is important. It reduces the packet sent in the network, but if we have it too low, it means we won't get the data to the destination. Last, last extension, selective flooding. In everything we've talked about so far with flooding, we just send to all of our neighbours, except the one who just sent it. Selective flooding, we select some of our neighbours to send to. So, for example, in normal flooding, node 1 sends to all three neighbours. Selective flooding, it uses some criteria to select three of the, uh, some of those neighbours to send to. <coughs> and there are different ways to select. Random. Every time I have a packet to send, randomly select one of my neighbours to send it to or randomly select two of my neighbours to send it to. For example, node 1 has three neighbours, let's select two and four. Send a copy to them, don't send to three. It will reduce the number of packets transmitted. That's the advantage of selective flooding. The problem is that the packet now will not go across this path to node 3, and will not traverse the least hop path to the destination. And even if we have a hop limit now, we may not get the data to the destination. Because if we select to send to 2 and 4 only, if we had a hop limit of 2, if we don't send a 3, 
then the packet will not get to the destination six. So selective flooding is good in that it reduces the transmissions, but it potentially is bad in that we don't get the data to the destination in some cases. Different ways to select. Random is just select a set of your, your neighbors randomly, do it differently each time. Round robin, it means what? Round robin means taking turns. For example, let's say node 1 has many packets to send, not just one packet to send to 6, but a thousand packets. For the first packet, it sends a copy to 2 and 4. For the second packet, it sends to uh, 3 and 2, and for the third packet, to 4 and 3. And the fourth packet, two and four again. Just taking turns selecting some of those neighbors to send to and go around and then when it comes back to the next one's turn, send to them. Sorry, another one. Probability based. Assign some probability to the links or to the neighbors. For example, I want to send 75% of my packets to node four. 20% of packets to node 2 and 5% to node 3. So now when I have a thousand packets, again you can choose randomly but give it some weighting such that most of the packets go to node 4, some go to node 2 and a few go to node 3. Why would, why would we, or what could we base the probabilities on? Based upon some knowledge about the links. For example, if we know that this is a, a fast link or a low cost link, send most of the packets in that direction. So we can have variations of selective flooding. And the main point, select a subset of your neighbors to send to. Don't send to all neighbors. All right, I'm not going to draw any examples for selective flooding. You can try them if you wish. All right, can we summarize on flooding? advantages and disadvantages of flooding. With full flooding, not selective flooding, with full flooding, all possible routes are tried. What that means is when we send copies of packets, at least one copy will traverse the least cost route, the minimum hop route. And we saw that in our example we had a copy of the packet that went from 1 to 3 and 3 to 6. So with full flooding, a good thing is that because we send on all paths, it means we must use the least hop path. That can be useful in some, some purposes when we want to find the least hop path. We can record, we can flood through the network. We know that one copy of the packet will arrive to 6 on the least hop path. And then node 6, if we record that path, knows the least hop path in that case and can use that to uh, set up connections, set up virtual circuits, or, or to suit some application. So it's sometimes useful to learn the least hop path. Flooding can do that for us. Another advantage of flooding, all nodes are visited. That means when I send a packet, all nodes in the network receive a copy of that one packet. So that's very useful if I want to distribute information to everyone. So far we've talked about, uh, flipping through, we want to send data from node 1 to node 6. Okay, so we use flooding and we got data from node 1 to node 6. But sometimes we'd like to send node, data from node 1 to all nodes, to all five other nodes. Flooding does that very easily because we send copies to all our neighbors. Okay, two, three, and four have received a copy. Now they send to their neighbors. All right, five, six have received a copy. Everyone's received a copy very quickly. That's useful when we want to distribute information, for example, about the network. If we want to tell every other node what are our link costs, then Record your link costs 
put them into a packet and flood that packet through the network and quite quickly every other node will know your link costs. Why do we do that? Well, we said when we do normal routing, fixed, adaptive routing, we need to somehow learn the link costs to calculate the least cost routes. And in practice we often use flooding to learn that. It's very simple. It's a very simple protocol to implement. The problem with flooding, it's very, very inefficient. We need to send many copies of packets just to get one piece of data from source to destination. If you increase the network from six nodes to 100 nodes, many links, then flooding creates a, a large overhead. That is, we use the network to send a small, we use a network a lot to send a small amount of data. If we use a, a hop limit which is too small or in some cases use selective flooding, we may get a case where the, the data doesn't reach the destination. That's ineffective communications. Any questions on flooding? This, this handout that you have, which we had the least cost routes on the left, <coughs> shows how I calculated this value of 34 for flooding. If we used a hop limit of 3 and no sequence number, I go through the steps. Okay, node 1 sends to 2, 3 and 4, that's 3 packets. 2 sends to 3 and 4, that's another 2 packets. And we go, I went through the steps and a total of 34 packets were sent. If we had no sequence number but a hop limit of 2, we'd send just 12 packets. With a hop limit of 1, we'd send just 3 packets, even better, more efficient. But the destination doesn't receive a copy. With a hop limit of 3, node 6 receives a copy. And here. With a hop limit of 2, 6 receives a copy. Good. Hop limit of 1, few packets sent. Good. But node 6 doesn't receive the data. Very bad. And then what if we have a hop limit of 3 but also includes sequence numbers? And sequence numbers allow us to not send the same packet twice. So once I receive a packet, I send it to my neighbours. If I receive that same packet again, I will not send to my neighbours again. We still get the data to node 6, but we only send 13 packets, which is much better. Adaptive routing, we mentioned, uh, we've mentioned uh, over the, today and, and la on Monday. We same same as fixed routing, except we regularly get updates about the network information and recalculate the least cost routes. So, learn about the network topology, calculate the least cost routes, create the routing tables. And then when we send data, use the routing tables to determine who we send to. Same as fixed routing. But we do that in an iterative process. We keep doing it. We keep learning about the network topology, keep updating the least cost routes, and keep updating the routing tables. So for that to work, it requires some information about the current network conditions or network status to be learned. And there are different ways to learn that. You can learn information which is local to your node. You can ask your adjacent nodes to send you information about their links or get information from all nodes. All nodes send information about their links to all other nodes on a regular basis. And that's common in, in networks. And how do you do that? Flooding is one way to do that.
it's improved in performance compared to fixed routing in that we more frequently use the least cost routes. It's more complex. The algorithms we need are often more complex, uh, take more time to, to process. And there's a trade-off between the quality of the information that we have and the overhead. Basically, the more information we collect, the more frequent we, frequently we collect it, the more accurate a picture we have of the network topology, and the more chance we can choose the best routes. That's a good thing. More information is good for choosing the best routes. But the more information we collect and the more frequently we collect it, it's bad for overhead because we need to send data through the network to do that. So we don't want to collect too much such that we create a high overhead, but we want to collect enough such that the information is up to date. I think that captures the main things that we want to know about uh, the advantages and disadvantages. It's like, again, coming back to our original example, we want to drive into Bangkok. Okay, so how do you choose a path? Anyone? How do I choose a path to drive into Bangkok? What do you do? Again? GPS. GPS, okay, so you you use some mapping software okay you get and that uses gps coordinates and it finds some path for you okay so you drive them along that those roads to get into bangkok and you do that every day you keep using that same path you don't need to check again because you know that path you keep following that same road you don't you don't check and use gps on your map every day you just follow the same road and you keep doing that for a year but it turns out that after a year, the roads have changed. There's been some road works, new roads are available. If you keep using that same old road, that original road, you may end up using the suboptimal path. There may be a better path to take because now there's new roads, a new highway. So to make sure that you get the best path from source to destination, you want to frequently update that information that tells you the best path. Frequently collect information about the new roads, uh, where the traffic jams are, all right, do it on a daily basis. The problem is to frequently collect that information, it takes some effort. And in our network, it, it consumes some overhead. So collect a lot of information, but to keep the quality high, but don't collect too much such that overhead is too high. And that's the main concepts that we want to introduce for routing. We talk about least cost routes, we have different, different metrics. In the earlier part we talked about the different ways to decide who routes where to collect information from, how often to update, how to create routing tables, fixed versus adaptive, and this, this other approach of flooding are the main concepts so far that we need to know about routing. Any questions before we move on about those concepts? Or about anything? Questions? There's a quiz available after uh, noon today. Uh, we'll cover some concepts of routing, some simple concepts, uh, some concepts of switching, the, the topic before, and some calculations or filling in some data for routing, and I think may, maybe not for switching, just concepts. For example, create the routing table. Calculate the number of packets sent. So we get a chance to practice that. The rest is really implementation details or some more details of how, how is it done today? How do we, 
how do we collect the information and create the routing tables? Well, routing protocols in networks do this job for us. Instead of someone manually have to calculate the routing tables, calculate the least cost routes, and to distribute the information, there's a protocol that does it automatically for us. And that's what a routing protocol does. Automatically collects information and determines the routes in the network and populates uh, the routing tables. It usually specifies the algorithm for determining the least cost routes, what algorithm to use, and there are different ones to choose from. What information needs to be exchanged between nodes, so what do we tell other nodes about our links? And the format of those messages, so I have to send a special message to all my neighbours. What's the structure of that message? What information does it contain? How, how big is it? That's usually specified by a routing protocol. How often to send those messages? Do I send a message to my neighbours every one minute, every one day? What algorithm do I choose to determine when to update my neighbours? What metrics to be used? Sometimes we can, uh, a protocol will specify, sometimes it's up to the user. And some, some often default values of some parameters. So that's what protocols design. There are many different real routing protocols. Some of the acronyms or uh, initialisms are, are listed here. OSPF, RIP, BGP and others. Uh, some are older, some are newer, some are used in the internet today and some are not so common. But there are many different routing protocols available. And they, they suit different size networks, uh, different uh, networks with different characteristics. We're not going to cover them in this course. You may see some of them next semester in computer networks, what's it called? Computer networks and network architectures. There's an example here. Again, I'm not going to cover that. It's only one or two slides. It gives an example of combining our adaptive routing with flooding. Link state routing. We use flooding to send packets about our current link state to other nodes in the network. We send some special link state packets. So we flood that through the network saying, this is my current link conditions. And using that, the nodes update their routing tables. They recalculate least cost routes and, and update their routing tables. For example, we will not go through details, node 1 periodically sends a special link state packet to all nodes in the network using flooding, and that link state packet would give us, give the nodes information about its links. I have a link to node 4 with a cost of 1. Node 4 has a link to me with a cost of 7. To node 2, 2 and 3. To node 3, 5 and 8. That information would be encoded into a link state packet and then flooded through the network so every other node knows about node 1's links. Every node does that. The end result that every node learns about every other node's links and now recalculates the least cost routes. There are other routing techniques as well. So let's finish this topic. And, and these two topics of switching and routing, because the, we, both of them are about, now we have a, a network, not just links, a set of links. <coughs> switching is the method of delivering data from source to destination across multiple links. So getting the data across those links. We have our stations or end user devices, those that create data and consume data like computers, servers and so on. And then special devices, switches inside the network that forward the data through the network. We saw there's circuit and packet switching. And within packet switching, datagram and virtual circuit packet switching. Techniques to show, to say how to deliver the data through the network. Routing is the process of determining the best path. 
determining the path to take from source to destination. So we need them both. We've seen the routing protocols, we have metrics, different strategies. We haven't looked at the algorithms, but we've mentioned there are different algorithms for calculating least cost routes, and there are different protocols. In practice, circuit switching used mainly in telephone networks, fixed landline telephone networks and some portions of mobile telephone networks. Still used today. Okay, so circuit switching is present maybe in, mainly in telecommunication telephone networks. Packet switching was developed to be more efficient for sending computer generated data. Think of normal internet applications. Telephone networks mainly developed for carrying voice calls. <clears throat> In the internet today, and many new wide area networks, we use packet switching. Specifically in the internet, datagram packet switching. <clears throat> In most large networks, wide area networks, we use adaptive routing. In small networks, we could use fixed routing, maybe even flooding, but in large networks across a wide area, adaptive routing. Different routing algorithms. <coughs> Excuse me. The trade-offs as to what is the best protocol depends upon the size of the network, how much data we're sending through the network, and how frequently that network changes. So there's no one best protocol. Any questions before we move on? What's the next topic? <coughs> LANs, local area networks. We're going to skip this topic, or we're going to cover it in the next 25 minutes. Okay. That is, we're going to skip most of the slides. Uh, you're going to. We've already mentioned different examples of <laughs> of lands. So networks for inside buildings, inside homes, inside a campus, and two common ones we know about. What in your assignment you're using IEEE 802.11 wireless lands, Wi-Fi. And in wide networks, we use wired LANs Ethernet, IEEE 802.3. And there are others. <coughs> the details of how they work, covered in these slides, or started in these slides, we're going to skip over. You're learning a little bit about wireless LANs in the assignment. Again, next semester, in another course, you will learn some details. <coughs> But let's, because we need some of the knowledge to move on to the next topic, let's just summarize some, some very simple things that we can say about LANs, local area networks. And we'll use a typical example of a LAN. Think of all the computers in, in the lecture rooms. <coughs> lecture rooms, offices, labs, they all have wired connections to them. You see the back of the computer, there's a LAN cable. Where does the LAN cable go? To a switch. Okay, it's hard to see, but there's a LAN cable in the back of this PC. Uh, this white cable down here goes down there. And it actually plugs into a socket in the wall here in the corner. And that socket has a cable 
and you can follow it. It goes up through here into the ceiling, and they go through the ceiling, and <clears throat> in this case, uh, there's a device in the third floor part of the computer center uh, that has a what's called a switch in there, and it plugs into there. And all of the rooms are similar, that they have this LAN cable that all plugs into this one central device. There may be multiple central devices. So what do we get? Uh, what sort of network topology? Let's try and draw. Uh, what do we have? We have a set of PCs or computers, different rooms or uh, different offices. So we look at a common topology for a LAN. And we may have some other... We have another device called a switch. Give them some numbers. Computers, just PCs in the different rooms or different offices, one, two, three, four, five. And this is a switch. And they're connected together by LAN cables. So that's a typical topology for a, a wired LAN. Our computers have LAN cables, those LAN cables all go back to one central switch. And then that switch connects out to usually some other, either another switch, if we have a large network, or some other computing device. I'll call that one R. So we can think this is our simple LAN containing some computers, a switch, and another computer. Or we'll call it R, it's usually performs some diff different operations. We'll refer to it later as a router. So when we want to communicate between computers in this LAN, there are actually six, but let's look at the top five. If Computer 1 wants to send data to another computer in the same LAN, computer 2, then what it does is it sends to the switch, and the switch sends to computer 2. And the protocols used there are part of the, the LAN protocols, or specifically IEEE 802.3, the wired LAN Ethernet protocol, determines how to send the data, how to connect to the switch, uh, and those details we're not going to cover. But this is a typical topology where we have what's called a switched LAN. All devices connect to some central switch. Even this, this computer R. What we want to mention is, okay, to send to another computer, we need to know its address. So if computer 1 wants to send to computer 2, in fact, each computer has a specific address, and the source, assuming it knows the address of the destination, we know who we want to send to, then we send a, a frame to the switch containing the source address, the address of computer 1, and the destination address, the address of computer 2, and that frame is delivered to the correct destination by the switch. So if the destination is 2, the switch sends it along this link to computer 2. What are the structure of those addresses? Well, we commonly call them MAC addresses, hardware addresses, uh, Ethernet address. 
And we've seen some examples of such structures. It's the same format of the address used in a, wired, in a wireless LAN. On my computer, <coughs> here's the MAC or hardware address of my wired LAN Ethernet interface, this f 0 b 7 This is my Ethernet or wired LAN interface. It has a hardware address and it's hard-coded. When I buy the laptop, that hardware address is assigned to the LAN interface by the manufacturer of the, the LAN card. And it's actually similar for, wire, similar for wireless LAN. We use the same structure of addresses. With my wireless LAN interface, I also have a hardware address, this 8C90. They are Ethernet, Mac, or hardware addresses. All devices have such addresses for communicating on, a, on an Ethernet or a wireless LAN. Uh, the structure of the address is that it's actually a 48-bit number. So just 48 bits. What's shown here is just some human-friendly form. You may not think it too human-friendly, but it's just converted to hexadecimal. Instead of writing 48 bits, my computer converts each four bits into a hexadecimal value. So into the value 8, the next four bits C, and so on, and writes it in this form. So in 12 hexadecimal digits. A little bit easier to read than 48 bits. The computers actually use a 48-bit value for the address and for the, the, the source destination address. So we'll see these addresses in, in many cases. So understand and, and uh, note that this is a hardware address or a MAC address. What does a, a frame look like? When we send data from 1 to 2, okay, we know the source address is the hardware address of computer 1, destination, hardware address of computer 2. There's usually, Ethernet defines a specific structure of the frame that is sent. And I think I have a, a, an example in the slides a long way through, towards the end. Uh, this captures the, the main parts. There's a lot of details here, but if this is our frame that we send from source to destination, the main parts, we have some data. Okay, here, this is the data. Before that, we have some two octets or two bytes that indicate the type of data. <clears throat> and before that, source and destination address. You see that six bytes in length, meaning at Six octets, six bytes, 48 bits. So the source address, sorry, the destination address, source address, the type of data, then the data, and then four bytes at the end, a frame check sequence is some error detection code, uh, which is used by the receiver to check if there's any errors in the data received. The rest we can ignore, any extensions we don't not not worried about extensions. So that's the typical format of a frame. And again, we'll see that, you'll see that in, in different practical tasks and, and some examples. Normally, the maximum size is 1,500 bytes for data. So a frame, 1,500 bytes of data, four bytes at the end, the trailer, and 14 bytes in the header is a typical size. What else can we say about LANs? <clears throat> okay, so if computer one wants to communicate with any of the other five, uh, four computers here, even the five including R, we use the source destination address, send to the switch, the switch sends to the destination. And there are some, some protocols or mechanisms for the switch to know which line to send on to reach the destination. So communications inside the LAN happen using the LAN protocol and the hardware addresses, usually via a switch. What if we want to communicate from computer one to someone out on a different network? 
not inside this land. Well, we need to connect to some other network and the typical way we do is through this gateway or router. So we may have some special device on this LAN, this computer R, which have another connection. So In a simple case, R could connect to another another switch. which may be connected to two other computers. So at the top we have our five, let's say, PCs connected to a switch which connects to a router, which connects to another LAN. So we'd say we have two LANs here. The top one, and then separated by a router, the bottom LAN. And again, this is a similar structure. We have one, two, three computers connected to a switch. S1, S2, let's say they are servers. Okay, so these are a web server, an email server. Some, just a computer with some specific task. So computer one, wants to send to some server, server S1. It sends via the switch to the router and the router then sends via this second switch to the server. So we have two LANs in this simple example, two switched LANs, and they're connected together via router. And we can extend this in that, okay, there may be a third router connects to another network, maybe a wide area network or another LAN, and we keep extending it and connecting LANs and wide area networks together via routers and we get an internet, which is the next topic that we're going to cover. So for this course so far, LANs, okay, know that a typical way to structure a wired LAN is using a switch and we connect all our computers into that switch. We can have multiple LANs. There are different ways to connect them together. One way is via a router. We have 48-bit addresses. Every device has an address, even the router. Even the router would have two addresses, two hardware addresses. One for this LAN, this interface, the cable's plugged in here. The router has a second interface with this second cable plugged into the other switch, or the second lane. So it had two hardware addresses. What else do we need to know about LANs? That's the main thing. Uh, there's some examples of networks. Okay, so the example I drew there was a simple one. Here's a little bit uh, larger network. <coughs> we have multiple LANs, so these green boxes here are the switches, the LAN switches. And we have multiple, so we have some computers connected into a switch. Uh, so think of this as one LAN, maybe for the, uh, the faculty members. Another LAN for some staff. Maybe another LAN for a different office, some servers, and we've connected those LANs together via a, some central switch to form one large local area network, which then connects via a router out to the rest of the world, out to the internet. So that's a, an example of a LAN configuration. And there are a few more examples there. Uh, okay, the last thing that we want to mention and I'll go back and find a slide. Maybe this one captures it. Actually, no, it doesn't. Ah, 
this one. How fast can we send in a LAN? What are the data rates capable? Well, depends on which version are we using. LAN technologies have been Im improved over time, so there are different variations. So often we talk about a common one used today is called generally fast Ethernet. The original LAN technology was called Ethernet and originally had speeds of 1 or 2 megabits per second and then eventually 10 megabits per second. That's the data rate. But commonly today our LANs support at least 100 megabits per second called fast Ethernet. The standard is IEEE 802.3. But there have been improvements and many devices, especially uh, end-user devices, support gigabit Ethernet, one gigabit per second data rate. And there's also 10 gigabit per second Ethernet, 100's not around, there's 40 gigabits per second Ethernet. But commonly in use today, 100 megabit per second fast Ethernet, one gigabit per second Ethernet, and in usually between servers, in data centers and so on, 10 gigabit per second Ethernet in some uh, large networks. My laptop supports 100 megabit per second and 1 gigabit per second, and most new computers will. They can usually switch between the ones so that both endpoints will use the highest one available. <coughs> Uh, wireless LAN, you're studying in, the, in your assignment. There are other LAN technologies. Okay. This is not the only ones. That's all I want to say about LANs, local area networks. How they work, the details, there are some slides in here. But I think uh, that's all we need to get through this course. In the next course you'll see some details about the technologies. If there's anything we've missed that we need, I'll mention it then. But let's just introduce the next topic. Internet protocols or internetworking. Just the first one or two slides to finish today. <coughs> so, what we have LANs and wide area networks, if we distinguish or simplify between the two types. LANs for inside buildings, inside your home, maybe across a campus. Wide area networks to connect buildings together, to connect campuses, to connect across sit between cities, between countries and so on. We have different technologies available for each. So SIT, inside our LAN we use uh, wide Ethernet, plus wireless LAN, Wi-Fi. Okay, we have two different technologies inside our campus. Other organizations, maybe the uh, Toshiba factory, have a variation of technologies. Maybe they have an old um, token ring LAN in their factory, or some fiber channel. So there's different technologies that they may use in their LAN. So different organizations inside, uh, inside their homes, in, or inside their buildings, may choose their own technology depending upon their requirements. Similar for wide area networks, there are many different technologies available to connect between cities, between countries. The company that runs the network will choose what's best suited for them. What we would like to do is to be able to connect any LAN or a computer on any LAN to, a compute, to any computer on any other LAN or wide area network in the, net, in the world. So this computer here on the wired LAN, I would like to be able to communicate with a computer in the US which is connected to some other LAN technology. All right, for that we need some path through the network. But they may be using different protocols and all the LANs and wide area networks in the middle may be using many different protocols, different technologies. But we still like to be able to allow any computer to communicate with any other computer. 
It doesn't matter what technology they're using, what LAN or WAN are they using. The, the concept of inter-networking aims to achieve this by connecting all these different technologies together. And we can visualize it like this. We have many different LANs and wide area networks. Inside these clouds, we may have a switched LAN, wide LAN, we may have a wireless LAN, some other technology, some point-to-point -point links, some microwave wireless links, satellite in the wide area networks. Different technologies inside these clouds. We'd like to be able to allow anyone on any of these networks to talk to anyone else. And the way that we do that is that we connect each of these clouds, these LANs and wide area networks, together using special devices called routers. And these routers will have the process of joining them together and allowing the two different networks using different technologies to talk to each other. So we perform internetworking using these routers, these devices in the middle here. And we'll see that routers are packet switches. So we come back to switching. And in the internet, they are datagram packet switches. <clears throat> so if we go back to our original slide on switching, we had switches in the middle and end stations around the outside. Well, same here. The routers are our switches, and I haven't drawn the end stations, but imagine on the LANs there are computers. Then we get a packet switched network, and in the internet, they're actually datagram packet switches. We use datagram packet switching. So this topic on the internet, internet working, and internet protocols, we're going to assume this is what we want to achieve, and we're going to look at, well, what does a router do? What protocols do we need? And we'll arrive at the internet protocol and cover IP. We'll introduce terminology. But that's the quick motivation of, OK, let's connect multiple LANs and WANs together. And we'll do that using internetworking. Enough for today. We'll cover that next week. <clears throat>